Welcome to season four, Fostering Change, the number one podcast in adoption and foster care. You know, each week we speak to the most amazing good humans about topics that touch each and every one of us. If you have a guest suggestion or interest in sponsoring our podcast, please visit us at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Now, sit back, enjoy, learn, get motivated, and let's speak to some fascinating guests. Well, you know what? It is so hard to believe that we are still in another season of Fostering Change. You know, I said this just last week that every single time that I end up thinking, you know what? I think this is going to be my last season. <laughs> I end up getting a book in the mail or I get an, an amazing call and I want them to be my guests. And then I start having these great conversations and I think, okay, I am loving this. Well, let me tell you something, everybody. This is another one of those moments. Um, you know, my producer, David, reached out to me and said, you really, really need to have this human on um, your podcast. And sure enough, you know, I am getting ready to interview Emily Chang, who wrote The Spare Room. Emily, welcome to Fostering Change. Thank you so much for having me, Rob. You know what, Emily, I will have to tell you, one of the things when I first started to read your book, um, I got a little bit intimidated. And let me tell you the reason why. I got a little intimidated because I thought to myself, am I going to really understand it? So by a, I didn't do any research. I don't like to do research. I just want to dive right into it. But I will tell you, after getting through the first couple of pages, I just... I could not put it down. So I really want our viewers and our listeners to know what made you decide to put so much rawness in this book? I feel like I've had the privilege of living 50 lives, you know, and I'm only 46. And with each of the kids that has come into our spare room and, and you've read the, the book, those are five of our stories, along with lots of other people's. We've had 17 kids and each one has been so unique. We've never even been formal foster parents. They've just come into our lives. And the only explanation I have is when you're willing to contribute more than you consume as a human, when you're willing to put yourself out there and say, is there a need? Is there something I can do? Yes, I am in. Yes, send me then I, I think they come and find you. And with each of these kids, we have such an amazing opportunity to see their background, to watch their transformation, to have a small part to play in their sort of moving on into the next step of their lives. It is such a privilege. And what I wanted to communicate was some of that realness of what it is to live life with them. You know, I thought that that was kind of surprising to me to know that these kids arrived in your home and you actually had not been, quote, licensed to be a foster parent, which is something that is, you know, so unheard of here in our country, especially. Did you get backlash by that? Or, you know, did people push back against you because you weren't licensed to take these children? Well, I think it was more, um, <laughs> our process is one of ignorance, but willingness. <laughs> so no, nobody has ever, ever given any negative criticism on, on that. But when I was my very first kid, I was only, I was only just 20 years old in college. I didn't know what I was doing. I just, I saw a kid hurt on the side of the street, sitting in the disgusting, freezing slush of upstate New York. And I just couldn't leave her there. And it was only frankly, a couple of months in before I was like, you need to be in school, don't you? I mean, I think I need to I need to put you in a home. And I didn't even know how to do it. And I didn't even know who to go to. So I went to my college counselor and she's like, I'm sorry, I am not equipped to handle this question either. So I think, like I said, it was more maybe ignorance, but willingness. And people right. have helped us as we've been trying to help people who we've had the opportunity to come in contact with. Yeah, I mean, the fact, though, that, I mean, we live in a society, my friend, that you are an anomaly, okay? You are an anomaly. You know, I was a senior in high school when I became homeless and aged out of the foster care system. And for the entire year, I was homeless. People knew that I was homeless. You know, teachers and counselors and neighbors and no one opened their door. And to know that you walk up to a total stranger a total stranger and open your house and then your heart, you know, I mean, it's just not heard of. I think that's a, that's a sad statement. You know, 
especially now, I, I don't know why I just suddenly got emotional as you said that I'm, I'm picturing, you know, you in high school. That's, that's so sad because we have so much to give. I mean, that's why I created this construct because I don't want this book to just have inspiring stories. I want it to be action oriented. I want people to read it and catalyze and say, damn it, I have to do something. Right, because right. if everybody, I read a statistic, if everybody did something. So this statistic said that if every church, one church, not everybody in a church, if every church adopted a child in need, there would be no yeah. kids in, in need wouldn't. of a family. Yeah, and I say that quite often, by the way, my friend, because I'm telling you right now, Emily, if every church, mosque, synagogue yeah. stepped up and did what yeah. the reason that they were built, yes. you know, which is to support and love and nurture our community, just one child. That's it. We would yeah. eliminate child welfare. We would literally eliminate. That's what child I had read. Welfare. Yeah, that's and the statement. Yeah. And, and to me, it's like, I, you know, I were Methodist and I remember, you know, I said to my, my minister, I've said to her several times, I was like, when is anyone ever called to talk to you or to talk to our congregation about children that are in need? And she says, never, never. Wow. And I think that we're losing so much as a human society by not keeping those bridges going. You know, I have to talk about, you know, it was really touching in your book when you talked about your, and I said, I call him your son. When here he arrives, you're told he's never going to talk. He's never mm -hmm. going to walk. He's not understanding anything that you say. And it made me think about my son, Makai. Mm. My son, Makai, was two years old when he arrived in my home. And the social worker literally handed him to my husband and said, are you sure you want this one? Mm -hmm. As if he was a piece of clothing. They said, he's never going to walk without braces. And this is probably all you're going to get from him. And he'll never speak. Mm -hmm. And I remember that hopeless feeling I had in my heart as a kid who grew up in the system where my husband has his master's and his parents have been together for 50 some years. And, you know, but for me, I felt the hopelessness. Take me back to that day when this little boy arrives into your home. One of the reasons you mentioned in the beginning of our recording that everything was a little bit raw in this book is I don't want people to look at us and think we're good people or that we've done something nobody else can do. I want to admit all my flaws and my weaknesses and tell you this isn't easy. When Teo first came to our house, I felt a mix of being overwhelmed. I'm out of my depth. He scared me a little bit. And there were times, honestly, I felt almost revulsion. That is a horrible word to use when you're talking about a kid you're trying to care for. But there is this boy whose head was so stretched, his eyes couldn't close. And they were bugged out, staring at you. You couldn't tell if he was asleep or not. He hated to eat or drink because he'd always been lying down and basically waterboarded every time somebody tried to give him water. So he would thrash and like he could barely move, but he would like, turn his you know turn his mouth away from you he would spit at you like it was it was gross and it was ugly and dirty and hard and i was like this kid is dehydrated malnourished what am i doing that was my first reaction to be honest i have to tell you i love you for being so honest because the thing that you started this sentence out and said, I don't want people to think, oh, look at the good people or what the good you did, but you were really right because I remember that moment too. I remember as I looked at this boy who had a blank look on his face, yeah. I just was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And, you know, people say to Reese and I all the time, oh my gosh, you guys are the heroes. You adopted five kids. No, no, it has been hard. It has been hard. But I also think about somebody has to do it. You know, yeah. somebody had to take your son. You know, that moment when I will never forget for my son, Makai, he was five years old, just getting ready to turn five. And he, ever, I remember he was in the nursery and I hear my husband screaming and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, something's happened to my baby. And yeah. at that point, we already had three other children, yeah. young kids. And I go running into the room and he's laying on the changing table and he's looking at my husband and he's saying, Dada. Data, oh. data. And it was the first word he ever said. And mind you, they said he was never going to talk. And he's just data, data. 
And I remember my my other kids at the time, they were, you know, six and four and two. And I remember them running into the, the room and and all of them started just screaming, Dada, Dada, because we knew what a joy it was to hear our son say a word when we were told he would never, ever going to speak. Yes. You know, something about your book that really touched me as well is your daughter. You know, when your daughter sat there, now, mind you, here's this little girl, she's your daughter, she, you know, probably thinking all of this is a little bit kind of what's going on, but it shows you again how beautiful children are, because you say in this book how your daughter actually taught you know her brother Mm -hmm. to sit up and and to roll over and to drink I mean what you've got to be the most proudest mom in the world moment I am I think one thing Chinese mothers are known for is understating their children's accomplishments oh she's too fat oh she's too dumb oh she's not as good as her cousin I'm the opposite of that I am wowed by my daughter I am floored by the human that she is she's extraordinary she was the one who convinced us to take Taya home when we thought it was going to be too much. She has learned how to make therapy toys for children of all different capabilities. She has infinite patience sharing her parents' time. And I do remember, you know, I always thought she just understands because, and frankly, she didn't know any other way of life, right? She's always grown up with siblings, older, younger, boys and girls. So she didn't know this was extraordinary, frankly. But I do remember one day we watched the movie Wonder. And of course, I'm in tears at the end and I'm astounded. I'm like, Lainey, did you love that? And she just had this stoic look on her face and she kind of went, no, I really didn't. And I said, you didn't? Why? And basically, she related a little bit too much to the older sister. She was like, I feel like that was a little close. And I was like, wow, I think she had sacrificed a little more than she let on, you know, and I think there were moments she probably held a lot more in than she shared with us. And I said, why didn't you tell us you felt like Veda? She said, how can I tell you that when this is what's happening to the baby? What I feel is not as important as the ability to help him. And I thought that was so mature for a a seven-year-old to feel. And I'm still trying to make it up to her. Yes. And and the fact is, is I can't even imagine, you know, that here she, and by the way, I have, I have, have experienced firsthand where a, a child has come into where there are birth children and the, the birth children, you know, no way this isn't happening and children having to be removed because the, and here your birth child, you know, said, I couldn't tell you because look at what this other child was going through. Yeah. Look at what this other child is going through. You know what, Emily, I will say this book, which, you know, by the way, everybody, it's called The Spare Room. Um, you not being a foster parent and not doing all the foster parent classes that are required and, you know, having a social worker come and visit your home twice a month, you not receiving a stipend and you doing this yourself. You know, I think about that spare room and I have to tell you, I wish I would have had that spare room as a boy you know, and, and I kept relating to that when I was reading your book. And I kept relating to the fact that, you know, we read so many books, and then we just put a period at the end of it. And there's not really like, what is my ask? What is my, and your book is a guide, a guide to actually say, this isn't, oh, look at these poor stories. But this is how we are as human. Listen, everybody, we're gonna have to take a quick break. But you know, the book is called The Spare Room. My friend Emily, she is outdid herself. I will tell you, I said it in the beginning, a little intimidated in the beginning of the book. Do not flip through it. You truly need to dive through it. And by the way, I even went back and read a couple chapters again because I just was so like, oh my gosh. You can, Emily, we can get this on Amazon. We can get it on Emily's website as well, which we'll be posting everything. And we're all going to be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that inspires our communities to bring hope and dignity to our youth that are in foster care. For just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Case mission and help us eliminate trash bags for kids who are entering foster care. For every $10 that you give, Comfort Cases will give a Comfort XL to a child entering the system. Be part of the change. 
visit comfortcases.org. Well, you know what? I say it quite often. The conversations that we have on fostering change are conversations that I think we all should be talking about around the dinner table. I think we all should be lifting each other up. And my friend Emily, when you read this book, The Spare Room, I'm telling you right now, it does nothing but make you feel that you can be part of the change. You know, Emily, uh, one of the things that I, I see quite often is someone who's, you know, in the child welfare system for as many years as I have adopting out of the child welfare system, is I feel that we are very, very uneducated as humans when it comes to children that are in need. And something that your book gave to me, and actually I was speaking to just to last night to my husband about your book, because we had a fifth child um, in 2019. I was giving a, a talk and I saw a child in need and we had given up our foster license. We had already adopted four children. Life was, you know, but I saw this young boy who was 18 years old. He was a senior. He'd been in the system and he was a child that truly just needed someone to love him. And three months after that moment, I met him, we moved Alex in, and we were the first couple in the state of Maryland to have a child from foster care live with us without a foster license, without a stipend. So you and I are so oh much gosh. alike. My son is now 21 years old. He just finished his sophomore year in college, and he's looking to go study abroad in London. And I tell you this story because as I was reading your stories and all the kids that you had, um, there has to be a moment that you stop and really realize that, you know, how you have changed the path of their lives. Hmm. Yeah, that is the biggest privilege. I think, like you said, this is not stories about, you know, one person doing good things or all these different amazing people I had the opportunity to interview. I think there's something a little flawed with the concept of sacrifice. There's a big difference between sacrifice and contribution. Sacrifice says that this is hard. I have to give up something else that matters to me. Contribution says I'm going to amplify my impact to the world. And frankly, whenever we think in contribution, it gives back to us tenfold. Wow, I love that. I absolutely love that. I want I want to repeat that again. So the, there's a difference between contribution and sacrifice. And for so many times, I think people think, oh my gosh, I have to sacrifice um, to take care of this child. I have to sacrifice to go volunteer at, at this you know particular nonprofit. I have right. to sacrifice to look at that human that's standing on the corner who is experiencing homelessness because of no fault of their own right but to you it's about contribution and contribution to our community you know i say it all the time emily your community's not your zip code it's our human race so yes. if you are contributing to your community you're building a stronger foundation um you know you you You've you've written about you've written about four of the children in this book, but you um you you your your family you've had like seventeen kids um over since you were. By the way, everybody, if you did not catch the first part of this show, you have got to go back and listen again. Twenty, you were twenty years old when you helped your first child, okay? And um, I'm not gonna say rescued, I'm not gonna say saved. Um, mm -hmm. You helped, your, mm -hmm. you contributed um, to the welfare of this young person. It, and I know every single child is different. And I know I look at my five kids and every child, I look at them and, you know, there's something about each one of them that they teach me. You know, my son, Makai, as I told you, um, who couldn't talk, he's now a sophomore in high school and just became the, um, the senior class president. <laughs> for the oh SGA. Um, yeah, exactly. Amazing. He's the SGA president. He's getting ready to go um, visit his very first college, which is Lynn University. Um, but, you know, I think about the fact of what he taught me. And my husband says this quite often, Makai taught us to look at the world upside down. You know, when everybody else was looking this way, Makai was like, okay, my brain doesn't work like that. And so I want you all to look at it like this way. Tell me some of the things that you were taught by some of the kids that were in, that have come into your home. Lotus comes to mind. She was the daughter of a prostitute. 
She is now working, by the way, I just talked to her at a hotel and she's graduated from manning the front desk to taking kind of behind the, the office responsibilities managerially. So I'm really proud of her. She taught me a ton. She was probably the most challenged situation in terms of what she had lived through growing up, not just in a brothel, but sharing one room with her mother, who was a prostitute and worked for her father, who was the pimp who ran the unit. As a little kid, she would tell me, you know, I, I showed her her room and she said, a desk? I said, have you not had a desk before? She said, no. I said, where do you do homework? She said, on the floor. And the floor of this room was not a clean floor. You know, it wasn't even tiled. She said it was dirt. So she would sit on the floor. Imagine this young girl sitting on the floor without light while her mother is servicing a client and she's doing her homework. This is how she grew up. And so she was exposed to unspeakable things and and treated um, very badly. So when she came to our house, there were so many things I had taken for granted. I thought I didn't, and yet I had to constantly recalibrate. I remember, you know, she she literally had never taken a shower before. So we gave her a shower. I said, look, I'm not gonna be your mom, but I do want you to clean yourself at the end of the day. And she said, okay, if that's what it takes. She was very callous, uh, particularly in the beginning. Whatever it takes to live in this nice place, I'll do it. And every time she opened that door, the bathroom that she shared with my daughter was across from my daughter's bedroom. The smell was just, it's very hard to explain. It was overwhelming. And one day I took, I got a glimpse of her, her uh, legs and there was black fungus just growing up her feet and wrapped around her legs. And I realized she doesn't know how to take a shower. Right. I mean, you take a step back and a step back. And it was again, my daughter who reminded me, she goes, mom, go see if the shampoo's even been used. So I went in and I still remember that powdery edge of the soap sitting on the side. It had never even been touched. So I had neglected to explain to her how to shower, how to use these products. And it was constantly humbling to say, I'm judging her, but it was my fault. I did not get empathetic enough to understand what she needs to enable her to help herself. You know what? And the fact is, is we all know that empathy is something we're not born with. It truly isn't. It's something that is taught. And, yeah. you know, when you're able to sit here, Emily, and say to yourself and to say to our listeners and our viewers that you were not empathetic enough and that you did not show, you know, let me tell you, you and I are so, I'm, I'm telling you, we're, we're both cut out of the same cloth. <laughs> you know, my daughter, you know, she was four years old when she arrived and I kept, couldn't figure out why she kept screaming when a toothbrush went her. She had never brushed her teeth before. Yeah, yeah. She had never, and she had eight cavities and it, she was in pain, but she didn't have to tell nobody. And, you know, it's, it, it's just to me, you know, it's so overwhelming at times, you know, when you see and hear these stories of these beautiful humans who, you know, we truly have failed. I mean, like this young girl you're talking about, she was literally a product of her environment of choices mm -hmm. other people made. Of choices yeah. other people made, yeah. you know, and you choosing to say you deserve more. You're not invisible. You're not disposable. You do matter has now mm -hmm. had this young girl who, by the way, the chances of her being a prostitute was a hell of a lot higher than her working the front desk at a hotel. Yeah. You know, yeah. and showing her the value of herself as a human compared to what she's been seeing. Let me tell you something. I know you don't want to say it. I know, but you truly, you are a good person human you are a good human i am so absolutely lucky i get to have amazing amazing guests but i will tell you emily this is one when my producers watch this this is one that will be submitted for the awards because i'm telling you the world needs to know that people don't do things just for the pat on the back they do things because they want a stronger community. And that's exactly what I see from you, you know? And so tell me what's next. Well, you and I were talking beforehand about some people are interested in making this a film. I think being able to show some of these stories would be an amazing, an amazing thing. My goal, you know, we talked about contribution before. My goal in life is a super simple formula. It's contribute divided by consume is greater than one. So I wanna contribute more, than I ever take from anything, anyone. This book is intended to just create a call to action. You know, like pay it forward. Everybody knows that phrase. Do you know who coined the phrase? 
Probably not. No. I don't either. I've looked it up twice and I keep forgetting the name. No. Because it doesn't matter who started it. It's that it became a movement that perpetuated. I would love if one day people are saying, what's your spare room? Oh, did you hear about the spare room? What are you doing? And let this create a new vocabulary for people. And, and if it's a movie or if it becomes whatever else, you know, I have a day job that I absolutely love. I'm hoping that the spare room also starts to take off so that people have a separate conversation that amplifies their impact in the world and gives them more joy in living every day. Yeah. And I think the fact is, is that you've got to take that leap. You have to take that leap. And the fact, you know, I can't imagine that there were not nights that you laid in bed with a total stranger in your home in the spare room. And you thought, what was their mental condition? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a son who his mother was 12 years old when he was born. And so he came into the system with bleeding of the brain, chicken baby oh. syndrome, broken ribs. And, at, you know, and he suffers, you know, he has definitely some mental challenges mm -hmm. to where he is not safe. Were there ever times that you, you thought about that? Yes. There was one young guy living across the hall from my daughter. We were in a small apartment at the time that I thought, you know, we don't lock doors in our, in our apartment. I don't know this guy. I have to admit from what I do know, I don't like him a whole lot. <laughs> and I remember with Lotus one day, you know, girl grew up in a brothel. I came home and she was teaching my, I guess, eight-year-old daughter, how to dirty dance, how to pole dance specifically. <laughs> so there are moments you're like, what is the impact this is going to have on my child? Oh my God. So, I mean, look, we don't want to be foolish and naive, but at the same time, we want to think about the potential upside versus the potential downside. And to me, the upside of shifting Lotus's life path versus the downside of her teaching Lainey perhaps some bad behavior or you know, it, it's always going to trump the downside. And same right. with that, that young man. I thought there are some risks. So let's make smart decisions. You know, I'm going to sleep with my door open. I'm going to make sure my daughter understands here are some things that she can do if, you know, if anything came up. Right. And, and on the other hand, we have the opportunity to shift this young guy's life in a different direction. Right. And the pros, bigger picture, always outweigh the cons. Yeah. You're so right. You're so right. You know, listen, everybody, um, it has been another amazing conversation with my friend, Emily. Emily, The Spare Room, I, I want it to be more than just a movie, by the way. So I just want to tell you, you know, because as I was reading it, I, you know, we so many times seen so much of this, you know, these, these docu-series that are sometimes just like brainless. I could see this in, in, you know, like a series, like, you know, where it's all these episodes of, you know, uh, of just, I just think that this is, this is a book, like I said, I always have a, a couple of favorite books that are sitting here on my shelf. I can tell you, this is the book, everyone, the, the spare room, it is more than you can ever imagine, um, you know, and take it from somebody who's read a lot of books, um, <laughs> I think each one of us have a spare room and that spare room doesn't always have to be in your home. Mm -hmm. Okay. That spare room does not. And that's something your book taught me, by the way, is that that spare room can be in your heart. It can be going and helping someone in the community. Mm -hmm. um, the spare room doesn't have to be a physical spare room. Mm -hmm. Emily, I just want to say thank you so much. I cannot wait for you to be back on Fostering Change because we have so much more to talk about. Listen, everyone, I say this quite often. Each and every person has an opportunity. You have an opportunity to wake up in the morning. You have an opportunity to decide whether or not are you going to be a part of the problem or the solution. I'm telling you, read this book and you will definitely want to be part of the change. This is another episode of Fostering Change, and I can't wait until we talk again next week. Welcome to the Fostering Change Podcast, Season 3. I'm Rob Shear, the founder of Comfort Cases and your host. Together, we have made such a difference in the world. We've met with leaders and change makers in the foster care system. We've met with charities and philanthropists, celebrities, authors, and so much more. We'll continue to bring you guests who will share how together, as a community, we can bring about change. Welcome once again to Fostering Change.